brought to you by Squarespace. In World War II, Lockheed developed a new type of fighter plane that could fly double the speed of any other aircraft. It had missions that could scout out enemy positions from high altitude, and it could even shoot down bombers long before they became a threat. All thanks to a new technology called jet engines. This would have been incredible, bringing forward the jet age years in advance and might have even changed the outcome of the war. But this was so futuristic that even the US military was afraid of it and cancelled its production. Meet the incredible, before it's time, Lockheed L-133 Starjet. The year is 1939. Rising tensions in Europe and an expanding Japanese empire have put the world on notice. These events overshadowed another critical new invention, the creation of the first jet engines. Lockheed engineers were excited by this new development and began several paper projects to create a plane that could fly on jet power, and by the following year had come up with a engine to power it the L-1000. Now, I can't stress that this engine was truly ahead of its time. It used a concept called a axial flow type engine that could provide a five and a half a thousand pounds of thrust while only weighing just over a thousand pounds. It would be a nearly a decade later when the British would come out with their own centrifugal flow engine design that was inferior. The L-1000 would be the pinnacle of Lockheed technology and in fact jet technology worldwide at the time and usher in a new age of jet transportation, as well as the obvious military applications. In fact, it's these military applications and the rising tensions with Japan and Nazi Germany that made the US Army very interested. They would authorize the construction of a prototype engine right away. And this presented the first challenge for our Lockheed engineers because they didn't actually have a plane to put the engine in. Enter our hero of the story. As I'll mention in a moment, Lockheed would need all the support they could get for this project, as they were bringing a totally new type of aircraft to the market. But this would be hard for the US government to understand, after all they had never heard of this concept of a jet engine, because Lockheed didn't have a website. Something that they could have avoided with today's video sponsor, Squarespace. That's right, if you're launching a new airframe or just need a new website, then Squarespace is the best website builder. They have plenty of great templates, or you can have a go building your own design with their powerful code free builder. They have built in e-commerce tech to add products and start selling, inbuilt email campaign marketing tools that are easy to use, and their sites are already optimized for mobile phones. Plus, when you click that link, you're actually supporting the channel by helping fund the animations and the videos that you love so much, so it's win-win. To get it, simply go to www.squarespace.com found and get 10% off your first site and domain. So don't be like Lockheed, be a supporter of the channel and click that link when you need a website. Back to the show. In effect, to prove that this engine was the future of aviation, Lockheed would need to build the first American jet aircraft to house this powerful new technology. It would be utterly futuristic and be unlike any other aircraft that had come before, looking more like something out of Buck Rogers than any plane flying in the world. It would have the inspiring name of the L-133-0201 and it would have a top speed of 612 miles per hour to a range of 310 miles. Now that range is pretty small, but remember back then jet engines were very inefficient. Using the P-38 Lightning as a base, the engineers first gave it a conventional mid-wing layout with prone seated pilot to eliminate the bubble cockpit and have better aerodynamics. 
but this would cause all sorts of issues with the guns, which I'll get to in a moment, and thus a different design would be needed. Next, they came up with the rear wing design, placing the engines at the back of the plane and giving the pilot more of a conventional cockpit. But the engine intakes on the side of the pilot wouldn't give it enough oxygen into the jet engine to get it up to the required speed. Thus, the final design would have the air intake move to the nose of the plane. A normal cockpit, a blended wing body with the same wings at the rear of the plane. Its wheels would also be powered and allow it to coast up to some serious speed on the runway to aid with takeoff. The D-shaped air ducts would move from the front of the plane around the cockpit to the twin engines at the back. Because the air intake was on the nose, the weapons would actually be mounted inside of it, particularly four 20mm cannons providing enough firepower to take out those enemy bombers. Now, this is where very early jet aircraft design is a little bit flawed, and it's only thanks to 70 years of hindsight that we can actually be critical. In an interview with one of the designer's children back in 2013, they admitted that their father had no clue where the guns would actually be in the production model. Whilst it was very novel to have the guns actually inside of the forward air intake, practically this was a very dumb idea. Gases and other spent fragments from the shells would be sucked right into the jet engine, and you thought a bird strike would be bad. Plus, if the air intake was at the front of the plane, where exactly would the ammo for these guns go? The landing gear? An eventual radar dome? Room was already at a premium, and this air intake was causing all sorts of problems. There was also the matter of range. Whilst the production model would have pushed that beyond several hundred miles, it was unlikely to be a very practical fighter for extensive use across the sea to battle Japan. So already practically this jet didn't make a ton of sense. But being the happy naive engineers back then in the 1940s, Lockheed took the concept to the government to be built. And the answer from those in Washington? Stop this nonsense and build more propeller planes. Let me explain. Now at first glance, this seems like a totally insane idea from the government. Here Lockheed had made an aircraft that, on paper, proved to have clear advantages over anything the Nazis or the Japanese had in the field in 1942. But these generals did have some legitimate concerns. The first was that jet engines were clearly an untested, unproven and undeveloped technology. It could have been a few more months, years or even decades to get it to work properly, and to bet the farm on something that might not work wasn't a high priority, especially considering that they already had fleets of propeller aircraft doing the right job. In fact, this project management of the engine, the L1000, was shocking. Due to wartime production, precision parts were hard to come by and the research stalled to a crawl. They simply didn't have the materials, expertise nor the capability to make this at the time. They were a decade too early. Additionally, fighter pilots at the time, as well as the crew, maintenance and the entire US war machine were trained on propeller aircraft. To introduce a new type of plane during a war would have been very difficult and again sucked away essential war resources. But it's the last point that was the most interesting. There was simply no need for this jet. At the time, enemy bombers and fighter planes flew around 10,000 feet at half the speed, so why would they need something so ridiculously overpowered? Ironically, they would encounter the Nazi Mi-262 only a few short years later, and development of the British jet engines put an egg on the US's face, making them scramble to come up with their own jet aircraft at the end of the decade. Ironically, much of the P-80 was based on the original design work of the L-133, and even shared part of the name, the Shooting Star. So, go figure. 
As for the original engine, the L1000 was outsourced from Lockheed who needed to focus on plane building and wouldn't actually be built until the end of the 1940s. It was simply too late, the war was over and history had passed it by. Now, I do have to wonder here, what if this aircraft had actually gone into production? The ramifications would have been huge, but like the Mi-262, perhaps it would have not have been made in large enough numbers to make a significant difference. But in the few battles that it would have been used, it would have absolutely guaranteed air superiority for the Allies, able to fly faster than any enemy aircraft that they could muster. Although it's the real alternative history ramifications that would have been the most interesting. For sure, Lockheed would have developed a faster bomber using this technology and in turn, jet commercial aircraft 10 years earlier than we had it today. Meaning we might be all flying around on board a Lockheed A300 Dreamliner instead. Wait, didn't Lockheed just develop a new tanker aircraft? <laughs> But maybe that's a video for another day. Thanks for watching.